corporations getting fat off the sweat of the workers, screwing investors, trying for bailouts and buying a representation, authority of war in the hands of those who stand to gain the most from war, making huge profits in the oil and weapons business, privatization of the basic needs of life, virtue and capital, and the price of the state of the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and petition the government for a regress of freedom. We are the people. We have the voice. What could you do with your voice to further a cause that's important to you? This is the story of a woman who's walking across America to raise awareness of our eroding democracy. We're here in Terre Haute, Indiana, and just got some fresh snow last night. We're about to go into the Tribune Star, which appears to be a paper for both Indiana and Illinois. I'm right at the border. It's about a 50-pound pack that I've been carrying the last week since I lost my support vehicle. And uh, amazingly, not too hard. I mean, I've been sore, definitely, and it's cold. So, shall we go inside? I can't find the leash. <laughs> Okay, just just call me back and let me know where. Okay, bye bye. People don't understand. I have to pay for my cell phone. It's just no time for chit chat. You're collecting grievances. Just the letters. letters to get to get to oh yeah, really? <laughs> quite a few. Really? It's and actually a pretty hard sell, but the people that do sit down and take the time to write them, right. they write it's just amazing. Things. Wow. That's what it's all about. You actually walk the whole way. Yeah, about 2,700 miles so far. Wow. And yeah. you don't look like you're packed for every kind of weather. Are um, you? Yeah, actually, you? I, I am. I don't have all of the stuff in my backpack. I've had a support vehicle until Urbana and broke down. So I just bought this backpack. So the grievances that you get, do they run the spectrum of politics and yeah, yeah. Actually, I probably get more from Republicans who voted for Bush <laughs> than I do from Democrats. Yeah, it's kind of strange. I don't really understand it either, but um, it yeah. seems like a lot of um, Democrats are kind of feeling hopeless about the you know, and uh, that's the only thing I can guess, but um, in the beginning it was mostly about the election. Uh, a lot of people thinking that, you know, President Bush is not their president. Um, and lately it's been almost exclusively against the war. Wow. Really? Really? Almost exclusively. I'm seeing so much resistance to yeah. this war from all over these tiny little towns you would never expect. They've been having weekly vigils, a lot of them, since September 11th. And uh, people would like to move beyond this, <laughs> this war mentality that, mm -hmm. that that's how we solve all our problems, yeah. just killing everyone. Yeah. Do you get frightened as a woman and her dog alone on the road at all? Never. Really? Never. You've never had anything happen? No, I bet the worst is that people just ignore me. They right. pretend that I don't exist. Right. This crazy girl and her dog walking yeah. down the road. In That's the beginning, cool. I was pretty scared. I was, I was terrified in the beginning. I didn't know what to expect. But I, I knew I wanted to commit my life to some something greater than me. Right. And it seems like a really important time <coughs> in our history. And I wanted to find out what people had to say. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you? What's your routine when you get to a new town? What do you do? Well, um, I have been doing it with a car, and I had a support vehicle for most of the time that I've mm -hmm. been on the road, mm -hmm. and uh, four different support drivers that would come and pick me up at the end of the day. But I haven't had any help since October in that sense. So I would have to drive ahead to the town that I was going to walk to, and then find a ride back to where I left off the day before, I see. and then walked to my car. Okay. And uh, it, it was a huge hassle, but at the time it didn't seem feasible that I could carry all of my gear. Right. Um, but we went, when my car broke down, 
we didn't really have much choice. <laughs> and it's not only feasible, it's it's actually kind of a relief not to have to deal really? with a car every day. Yeah. yeah. I just put on my, my backpack and go. And okay. So it's, it's much easier <laughs> in a lot of ways. What would you describe your talent as being your psychological or psychiatric counselor? Um, yeah, and it was good training for this because I just I listen to people's problems and I try to help them solve it themselves because I can't solve it for them. But but I do have um, a great deal of information about organizations that are out there already working on issues that are important to people, and so I can connect folks with with those organizations and and uh, just encourage them to to speak up. And if your representatives aren't representing you, then right. It's your responsibility to tell them. Right. Um, and who are you in contact with here in Terre Haute? Who's sort of um, well, I, I specifically came to Terre Haute to go to the Eugene Debs house. Oh, okay. And okay. so I, I met the people out there, and we went to the Unitarian Church yesterday. Okay. We met some really great old activists that have been around since the 60s. Okay. So we've met quite a few people, actually. Okay. Well, I really prefer taking the back roads. Right. Because those are the people that really don't have a lot of interaction. I mean, a lot of these towns have not changed in a hundred years, yeah. literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's. I love going out there and, and talking to all these people. Do you intend to contact the White House? Do you intend to yeah, tell them you're I'm, coming? I'm still drafting that letter. Okay. <laughs> actually. Okay. Because in the beginning, I didn't really know what I was doing, and so it was kind of hard to articulate. Right. And I didn't feel like I had any sort of connection with right. the President of the United States. But right. but now that I've been doing this for a while, I, I like to think that, that maybe he just really doesn't know mm -hmm. how people are living and what they're going through. Um, the fact that the vast majority of people out in middle America don't have a living wage job, they don't have medical insurance, just basic, basic stuff. And, and people feel like that's what they want their tax dollars to go to. And they should be heard. Do you go to diners, little places, to try to get people? Yeah, actually, I was going to say, on Wednesday at 5 o'clock, I will be at the University of the ISU uh -huh. at Homestead Hall. Ooh, and I bet that was the person that was trying to call me to give me the number. Who does fund all this? Who um, you've got? The people of America. <laughs> okay. Honestly, just the people that I meet doing this walk. and. Uh, it wasn't for lack of trying. I taught myself how to write grants, but um, I don't qualify because I'm an individual. Right. And um, I, I quickly realized with the process that it's really just tax-free money for rich people's kids. That's what grants are. <laughs> and so I figured, well, you know, I'm not going to let money be me. So I'll just get a big dog and set it on my own. Okay. And so Sherpa was adopted specifically for this purpose? Yeah. Okay. All right. You think she knew what she was getting into? Um, no, <laughs> but she was about to take the long walk. She's walking all the way across America. She started 15 months ago in Seattle. And she is going to deliver a list of grievances to President Bush. And people can send them by hand or uh, if she meets them or to her uh, website or email address. Um, so that's what we know about tonight. Okay. And she's a very brave person. And this is Sherpa, her dog. They are about to head out of here. They are doing, doing a presentation Sherpa. Wednesday. Yes. S-H-E-R-P. And uh, they're going to do a presentation Wednesday at ISU. At the student union. Just bring a quick plug in there for people who want to go. And, um... And you spell Jeanette? J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E. -E okay. And it's W-A-L-L-I-S. I-S. Okay. I have a really difficult one. I need to have some sort of cute little moniker. <laughs> Granny, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what am I? I'm, I'm the walking girl. Do you know Wallace? <laughs> that name will soon be famous. Well, right? I don't know. <laughs> walking girl seems to be more famous. <laughs> yeah, that's what people know me as. Where do you stay at night? I mean, how do you work all that? Uh, well, a lot of people have been taking me in actually okay. since I left with the backpack. I've only had to spend one night out. Oh. Um, yeah, it was it was getting pretty dark and it was about nine degrees, thirty five mile per hour winds and uh, nobody had stopped to offer me a place and so I, I had to be prepared for that. Right. So I have a sleeping bag and a little baby sack. And I saw a little pond on the map, so I walked down to this pond off the dirt road 
and there was a little duck blind there. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, I had shelter for the night. I was really happy to find that duck blind because wow. it was incredibly windy and cool. <laughs> um, but that was the only night I had to sleep out so far. Where was that? That was on 36. Yeah. I sat frozen here going, I'm going to screw their hair. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these fake ducks out there. I didn't feel like caring because I was so tired. That's why you really wanted to come back. Yeah, I just wanted to get off, dude. <laughs> See, isn't this great, though? Who would the view? Yeah, it's it, great. Late front, uh, late front property. Yeah, I just slept there. And I like the score part. They weren't doing so well. I guess not. Except Sherpa was trying to get into my sleeping bag all night. Because <laughs> we used to have a tent that I can't carry the weight, so now I have just a bivy sack, which is uh -huh. just enough for my sleeping bag. And she kept trying to crawl in through the top. <laughs> we didn't get much sleep. No. Was it everything that you thought it would be? Well, uh, and less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really happy with it. But I'm just because you're walking your talk. This is what I usually do. I'm in the woods. This is my home. Do you ever get people that don't want to talk your ear off? Oh, yeah. Walk. They want to walk with you oh, yeah. and talk about their well, these, divorce. Well, a lot of these all retired farmers. Yeah. You know, they just sit around and cafes and they make rounds. They'll start at four in the morning at one place yep. and they'll move over to the next one at seven. Uh -huh. And they just, they talk about everything. Politics, they're very, very smart. Uh -huh. Which I didn't really realize when I started this. I don't go to big cities. Okay. I might, if there's something going on, right. and if I can get a ride up, I'll well, go. Because okay. occasionally I'll be able to speak at a rally. What do the people in your life say about this? Um, well, everyone really freaked out in the yeah. beginning. <laughs> they did, because I, I was always pretty quiet and shy and rather insecure um, until I had all these experiences happen to me that I just felt really compelled to, to do something, to share my story mm -hmm. with people and show them that anything is possible, that mm -hmm. I can go from being this apathetic, typical generation Xer to, mm -hmm. to walk into this America. Mm -hmm. um, but my friends weren't I think they were really worried about me, and they figured if they didn't talk to me or support me in any way that I wouldn't do it, and of course I'm, I'm way too stubborn for that, so I just did it anyway, but, it, but that was kind of hard in the beginning, because I expected support from the people around me and from my family, and I really didn't get any, but, but I think that's an important lesson also, that sometimes you do have to have this, this standalone spirit, and be courageous enough and believe in yourself enough that, that you'll just do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. Do you have a cell phone? Do you keep in touch with yes, them? Okay. Very expensive cell phone. Yes, I imagine. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's my big expense now. Okay. Um, and then I check my email at, at libraries and such. Yeah. I have an amazing web page that this woman's been doing for the last two years for oh, me really? for free. Well, what do you want to do when this is done? I mean, I don't know. Really? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure that out, too. Okay. But um, I never expected I would be walking across America, so I figured, right. well, I'll just keep my eyes open and <laughs> something will turn up. This is Villa Grove, Illinois. Population about a thousand, I think, last time I checked. And uh, this is the Shangri-La Hotel where they put me up for the night. Very Let's go see if they remember me. How you doing? Well, refers us to the veterans. Yeah, so they... Mm -hmm. And most everyone that lives here is a veteran. Uh -huh. And then they take in people like me, too. So. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we we try street. to help all the people we can, and and uh, we feed people that either doesn't have money or just hungry. Yeah. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Oh, well. Yes. 
so great. Come on up, Katie. Good. We have a dining room in here. Another dining room. And downstairs in the basement uh, is the one that ambulatory veterans. Yeah, and they had a they had a podiatrist in here. Yes. Trim the ankles and nails. Can you think of anybody that is going to do this whole grievance thing? Anybody that would have a good grievance that they would have? Ah, uh, Ricky downstairs is the one talking to. Yeah, we have a good grievance. Here's a, here's a room. This is the other. She's a mama for all of us. Yeah, I am. I'm the mother of Shangri-La. <laughs> <laughs> She's skipping her hair back now because she had ke chemotherapy. Yeah, I had chemotherapy Did last you? year. Yeah. Oh. Is it all? I had cancer. All better? Just cancer. Uh, yes, they said the um, uh, neutron radiation killed it all. Wow. And then, they, and then I took the chemotherapy to get rid of it. So I had breast cancer. Wow. Mm -hmm. you survivor. Yes, I'm on six years and I'm a survivor. That's so great. Yes. She moved. We're glad we got her back. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> really? Thank you. <laughs> Everyone here is filled with veterans. We have a couple apartments. This is one apartment right here. Oh, so people live here. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes. I was here. Yeah, we'll see. They come here from the VA and they want to stay. I so know. everybody's <laughs> free to come and go as they please. Yeah. And uh, there's not this. enough places like this. So really, it's, 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 a, it's a, a real hotel, Shingle Hotel. hotel. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, veterans live all over the United States in hotels. Yeah. And this is just one place that I try to make it this home sweet home. I wrote this poem back in 1998, I think it was. One of the very first ones I ever wrote, and I entitled it, No Dreams. It goes like this. Have you ever had long periods of time when no dreams ever came to mind? Some in the daylight, but none in the night. Some are from superficial war scars. Some make you wake with the cold sweats, and once in a while, hot flashes that give you fret. There is no cure for the thousand-yard stare that some of us have and only does God care. Once we have the enemy in our sight, is it God's will that we take that life? What about love thy neighbor and thy enemy too? Isn't it our commitment to share God's love of all through and through? Have you ever searched your heart out and made sure you have no doubt? Doubt is of the unknown, and each of us has our own. With doubt in our minds, we shall never have time for the loved ones of our lives until we let God take the reins of our mind. Such good poems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't think. Where are we again? What's this town? This is the Villa, Villa Grove, Villa Illinois. Grove, Illinois. This and is the. Uh, let's here. see what you call this place. Well, this is the Shangri La Hotel. The old hometown I came from. The old town was called Oblong, Illinois, which is. It's just in the middle of the road, you know, and you blink your eyes when you go through it, you'll miss it. You know, but uh, that's where I came from. And I've been here since September uh, 2000. I'm not a landowner myself, uh, but I used to farm land that belonged to my dad. And uh, my mother now still owns this farm ground. She has 160 acres. And, uh, or 140 acres, really, uh, down in Crawford County. That's it's prime farmland for that area down there, but up here it'll be full down because of the difference of the soil texture. There's a lot of it down there is sand and home, whereas this up here is um, sand is, is not so much sand, but it'll only uh, consistency of clay and all of this kind of stuff, and it uh, doesn't require near the fertilizer like it does down there. And it costs a lot of money to drop the corn out down there. Just does. Uh, I don't know what it's, I don't know what it's like around here, but uh, you know, the American farmer, the bigger farmers are eating up the smaller farmers, and therefore that's why we don't have any small farms anymore. And you used to go around when I was a kid. You know, a 40-acre farm was a big-sized farm. You know, for, for a farmer down the, down that area. But uh, if you don't have 4,000 nowadays, you're not a farmer. 
I mean, the farmers work for the government, basically. They you now work yeah. for the government. The government sets the prices. The government tells you what you can and can't plant. Yeah. And we, we have. We've gotten so far away from, you know, just even from 100 years ago, when we had the family farms all more sustainable form of agriculture. But most of the corn that I've seen out here probably goes to feed for cows. A lot of death, dismemberment, everything, being a medic. And I, yeah. You know, that kind of... set some of my uh, disability in motion, uh, which uh, I don't receive any compensation for my disability other than just to disability. Uh, which is probably not enough to live on. I'm paying my rent here. Well, you got a good place to it, it, it covers all the costs that I have that incur in you know, here at Chamber you know, so uh, I do this to, uh, to help them out here. You know, they help me and I help them, so we just pat my back up like George, you know, so to speak. This is how human beings are supposed to interact, I think. Well, it is. You know, All but, of us. But who does? Yeah. yeah. How many people do? I, a lot of people do, but I'm not, anyway. Do? It's been eye-opening doing this walk, because I sort of thought that I was going to go out and teach all these stupid people that didn't know anything, <laughs> and they've done nothing but teach me, and, uh, and I realized, you know, we all want the same thing. So we, Two things we need in life. Peace. Oh, beside that. Security. Beside that. Compassion and love. Yeah, that's good. Compassion. Compassion. What is compassion to you? Compassion to me is a mutual understanding between one and another. Honoring each other's ideas. Even if they're different. Even if they're different. different. Yeah. Still honoring them. Respecting them. Uh, you know, so many people don't uh, respect other people's rights and their property and everything, and that's why we have this this turmoil that we have today here in the United States. Part of it, I think, is because of the lack of respect for one another. Yeah. Uh, well, because we're made to people. fear each other so much. Right, right. You know, we're having this this, this deal now. It's a big deal now. Is if you do me wrong, I'm going to sue you. And I'm going to get out of you what I can. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, I'm going to sue you for more than I get. Uh, you know. Or kill you. Or kill yeah, I'm going I'm I'm to do, I'm gonna do but I'm an injustice that you, you can't do unto me. Same thing, because I'm going to allow it. And that's some of the mentality that's going on in the in, uh, in the world today. I see it all the time. You know, uh, I'm a firm believer that when God comes back, and he's going to come back pretty soon, it's, you know, uh, this, this thing happening over in, uh, over in overseas in the Middle East with uh, Iraq and Iran and all that. I can see it coming to a complete screeching halt with Armageddon being in Jerusalem, being the final war. Of it does kind of feel like that sometimes. Like I mean, we're seems, coming to some like, kind of I mean, uh, It's all been prophesied in the Bible. Things are coming true. We're following the place. They have been for quite some time now. And we're liable to see it in our lifetime. We're liable to see Jesus Christ come back in the flesh. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and what do we want to be doing? We want, we, we want to be repenting and, 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 and being sorry for our sins and give to Him what He gave back to us. And until that time, you know, there's a lot of people that sort of like look forward to the dark in a way like look, it's a relief, you know, not to have to deal with all this. I don't look forward to the war, but I do look forward to the judgment day. Right. You know, when he makes his final decision as to say, well, you go on in the gates or you stay out, whatever the case is, he's the one to make the final decision. We can't make that decision for anybody else. I can't make it for you, you can't make it for me, you can't, you can't make it for him. That's a general call God's going to make itself. And it's going to be based on what we do also. It's going to be based on a lot of what we do, you know. But our works, our works, is, our, our good works, it's not going to get us into heaven. Repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and we feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Compassion and love. Uh, through 
this filling power of the Holy Ghost. I'm Pentecostal, and I'm a, I'm a firm believer. When he comes back, I mean, he's going to look down on this rash of immorality, sexuality, in, 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 infidelity. You're going to look bad about this kind of thing. And I'm not sure what he's going to do. But he's also going to look right here in Villa Grove at the Shangri-La Hotel. And he's going to see people treat each other like we're supposed to treat each other. True. You know? True. And I think that's important, too. We only hear about the bad things. Right. There's a, there's a lot of good people out there who just want to live their lives. Yeah. And what's going on in Iraq and Korea, it doesn't really affect the people that are especially living well, in these small towns it's like who it. choose to live a simple life because that's their choice. Right. The media does not really represent the people that I have seen in doing this. Well, well. This, is, this could be true. This could be true. They're, they're just trying to manipulate. Never. And most people don't buy into it, but, you know, for whatever reason, because the, the media is liberal or because it's corporate or, you know, people have different reasons for not believing it. But it still makes people afraid on a sort of subconscious level. And they see someone like me, and it doesn't compute. And how can I be walking across America by myself and not be afraid? You know, if I thought about all the things that I should be afraid of, I would never You would never start out. You would have started in the beginning. Yeah, and, it, and so it's, it's important to me to go out and prove that, hey, this is possible, that, that people will take care of you, that human beings aren't so bad. <laughs> There's a few of them, obviously, the, that, but they don't represent in every, most of they're us. They're in every town. It's not a yeah, sure. They're not a majority. They're not a majority. They are a minority. They really are. But they're trying to drag everybody down to their level. Mm -hmm. You agree with that? Yeah. But you see how they are. If you, if you walk up to some people, and they're smoking dope, drinking beer, whatever, and doing hard drugs and having their way with these girls all the time. And they say to you, come join in the crowd and how much fun you're going to have. Is that really fun? Yeah. Is that really fun? And there's also the people who are living in, in their eyes, suburbia, right, who they are saying, drag you down buy the big level. house, have the, the two SUVs in the driveway, yeah. have the four kids yeah. that go to college and all this stuff in your house. Yeah. And, and you'll be Materialism happy. Materialism doesn't mean a thing to me. And they're not happy like either. They're, they're really unhappy, actually, I mean, a lot of those people. And they don't know it. Thing, because like, they have everything they need. It's like over happy. here at Tesco, the, this Iron Horse Road, over here where the Iron Horse Golf Course is. Mm -hmm. You have all these houses all in a row, shaped like the same all the way through. $300,000, $350,000 homes. Out here? <laughs> Tesco, <laughs> Tesco. Yeah. Dang. Tesco, over there by the golf course. Oh, that's like Seattle prices. And, uh, you know, they all look the same. And I, if, if I was to wager, and I'm not a wager person, but if I was to wager, I would say that you could go into any one of those number of houses and you'd find more empty rooms with furniture out of them than you would with a, you know. Sure. Yeah. Two people living in a 25 bedroom house. <laughs> right. That's, my point. That's my point. That's my oh, point. Oh, it's just. You know, it's just nothing more than a status symbol. Yeah. yeah. Nothing more than a status symbol. And yet people get these status symbols and then they're still not happy. So then obviously it's a chemical imbalance. We need to take all these drugs. And yeah. <laughs> and people aren't getting to the root of what, what, hap what happiness is, what love is, what compassion is. I think about that a lot, and compassion to me is, is the root of the word means to suffer with, to struggle with. So if you're going to have compassion for someone who's living in a third world country, it's really not enough to uh, write a check and, and send it off. That's, that's not no, being that's compassionate. No, that's not being compassionate. Compassionate is deciding that you're in the same struggle together with this person in the third world. And, Giving of and, yourself. And teaching. Yeah. Giving of yourself. Teaching others. Teaching others. No. So we're driving the route that I walked. This is the Midwest. <laughs> this is what I've been seeing for hundreds of miles. Yeah, now I want you to imagine yourself as a girl walking on this road. 
yourself in a situation where you really have to go to the bathroom <laughs> and ask yourself the question, where do you go? That's, that's what I have to uh, wrestle with every day. Yeah, it's, uh, sometimes there'll be a bridge a couple of miles down the road. Dress. This is what's called winter. <laughs> but look at this cool little thing we found. Look right here. Check it out. It's like trees, maybe Christmas trees, that have been tied to cinder blocks. And so when the water thaws in the spring, these trees will sink and will be nice little homes for fish because this is a little fishing pier. So, a little ingenious thing. For my uh, friends and family down south in Texas, this is what's called a frozen lake. Well, this is the house of uh, Dr. Hiram Rutherford, and he was a physician, uh, I was told, from out east, who decided that there were too many women who were better physicians than him out east, uh, midwives and such, and so he came out to this little rural town of Oakland, Illinois, and lived in this house. And it was rumored, suspected, that he harbored slaves uh, and helped him with the Underground Railroad. And uh, apparently he tried to, to seek the help of Abraham Lincoln in representing him. And uh, Abraham Lincoln had already been hired out by the other side. And it's the only case that, that they believe Abraham Lincoln represented as labor. And uh, he lost the case, some believe, maybe on purpose, but the slaves were eventually freed. So it's a bit of old history. And he would live here. And across the street, he had his, uh, his physician's office. So we would sit in this window and read and, and wait for patients to come by. It's a quaint little town. We're trying to find Eugene Debs' grave, which I'm not even really sure if we're in the right cemetery, but um, it's supposed to be a fairly small headstone. Nothing very ostentatious for them. Um, but people can't give directions in the Midwest. And uh, the, the direction I got was go down past the railroad tracks to the cemetery with the big gate, which is like two miles past the <laughs> railroad tracks. And there's two cemeteries with the big gate. Um, and then it's, of course, on the fourth row towards the front, uh, which well, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> and we might not before they lock up in this area. But but Eugene Debs was a great man. He, uh, I believe the famous phrase, if there's a lower class, I am in it. If there's a criminal element, I am of it. And as long as there's a soul in prison, I am not free. I say that a lot, actually. I say that a lot. On the road. A huge little castle like that. And then in front of it, it would not allow people to drink water. Parch, damn it, I'm dead. You can't drink the water around here. It's cold. <laughs> so this is the home of Eugene V. Debs. And I don't seem to have much luck with Mr. Debs lately. Couldn't find his uh, gravestone, and now the museum's not open. Um, so this home was actually built by his wife from a large inheritance that, that she had received from her aunt. And he was always rather embarrassed by it. It's a huge house has very, very nice things inside, and so his railroad buddies weren't really allowed inside because they were all dirty and busy. But actually, there's a, there's a picture inside. When he died, um, people came up and did speeches from this porch, and out this entire parking lot was just full of people, like 5,000 people showed up for this, this funeral. And um, they actually wanted to tear this building down to add on to this lovely parking lot. Um, but the people were man managed to save it, mostly from the Unitarians, I think. They, they had a lot to do with it in the Eugene V. Debs Society. These are all Union people. That's pretty neat. William Silvis, father of the eight-hour day campaign that we used to enjoy before we had to work overtime. Mother Jones, the most dangerous woman in America. She's my hero. So 
somebody at a some sort of rally had introduced her as a humanitarian and she got up and she said, make no mistake, I'm not a humanitarian, I'm a hellraiser. <laughs> She's just a little old woman. People were scared of her though. And then walked to my car. Okay. And uh, it, it was a huge hassle, but at the time it didn't seem feasible that I could carry all of my gear. Right. Um, but we went, when my car broke down, we didn't really have much choice. Right. <laughs> and it's not only feasible, it's it's actually kind of a relief not to have to deal really? with the car every day. Yeah. yeah. I just put on my, my backpack and go. And okay. So it's, it's much easier <laughs> in a lot of ways. What would you describe your talent as being your psychological or psychiatric counselor before? Um, yeah, and it was good training for this because I just I listen to people's problems and I try to help them solve it themselves because mm -hmm. I can't solve it for them. But mm -hmm. but I do have um, a great deal of information about organizations that are out there already working on issues that are important to people, and so I can connect folks with with those organizations and and uh, just encourage them to to speak up and. If your representatives aren't representing you, then right. it's your responsibility to tell them. Right. Um, and who are you in contact with here in Terre Haute? Who just sort of um, well, I, I specifically came to Terre Haute to go to the Eugene. Corporations keep fat off the sweat of the workers, screwing investors, trying for bailouts and buying a representation. Okay. Authority of war in the hands of those who stand gaining most from war, making huge profits in the oil companies. Privatization is basically the price of the or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a regress of freedom. We are the people. We have the voice. What could you do with your voice to further a cause that's important to you? This is the story of a woman who's walking across America to raise awareness of our eroding democracy. We're here in Terre Haute, Indiana, and just got some fresh snow last night. We're about to go into the Tribune Star, which appears to be a paper for both Indiana and Illinois. I'm right at the border. It's about a 50 pound pack that I've been carrying the last week since I lost my support vehicle. And uh, amazingly, not too hard. I mean, I've been sore, definitely, and it's cold. So, shall we go inside? I get my leash. <laughs> actually walk the whole way. Yeah, about 2,700 miles so far. Wow. And yeah. you don't look like you're packed for every kind of weather. Are um, you? Yeah, actually I, I am. I don't have all of the stuff in my backpack. I had a support vehicle until Urbana and broke down. Oh, no. So I just bought this backpack. Okay. So the grievances that you get, do they run the spectrum of politics and yeah, yeah. Actually, I probably get more from Republicans who voted for Bush <laughs> really? than I do from Democrats. Yeah, it's kind of strange. I don't really understand it either, but um, huh. it seems like a lot of um, Democrats are kind of feeling hopeless about the you know, and uh, that's the only thing I can guess, but um, in the beginning it was mostly about the election. Uh, a lot of people thinking that, you know, President Bush is not their president. Um, and lately it's been almost exclusively against the war. Wow. Really? Really? Almost exclusively. I'm seeing so much resistance to this war from all over these tiny little towns you would never expect. They've been having weekly vigils, a lot of them, since September 11. And uh, people would like to move beyond this, <laughs> this war mentality that, that that's how we solve all our problems, yeah. just killing everyone. Yeah. Do you get frightened as a woman with her dog alone on the road at all? Mm -hmm. Really? Never. You've never had anything happen? No, I bet the worst is that people just ignore me. They right. pretend that I don't exist. Right. This crazy girl and her dog walking yeah. down the road. In the beginning, I was pretty scared. I was, I was terrified in the beginning. I didn't know what to expect. 
but I, I knew I wanted to commit my life to some something greater than me. Right. And it seems like a really important time in our history. And I wanted to find out what people had to say. Okay. And um, what do you? what's your routine when you get to a new town? What do you do? Well, um, I have been doing it with a car, and I had a support vehicle for most of the time that I've been on the road, mm -hmm. and uh, four different support drivers that would come and pick me up at the end of the day. But I haven't had any help since October in that sense, so I would have to drive ahead to the town that I was going to walk to, and then find a ride back to where I left off the day before. I <laughs> Okay, just, just call me back and let me know where. Okay, bye-bye. People don't understand I have to pay for my cell phone. <laughs> it's just no time for chit-chat. You're collecting grievances. Just Any letters to get to my... Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> Quite a few. Really? It's and actually a pretty hard sell, but the people that do sit down and take the time to write them, they write, it's just amazing. So, wow. That's what it's all about.